Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off. And said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you. The fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off when Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Let's have a word of prayer together. O God in heaven, we come in the name of Christ and ask for the Spirit of God to empower the preaching of your word, to strengthen us, to sanctify us. And we pray, God, that you would also empower the hearing of your word, that you would save sinners, dear Lord, and make your church even more united and more holy. We thank you, dear God in heaven, that we have the privilege of opening your word, and we completely rely upon you to understand it and apply it properly. In Christ's name, amen. So we're in today the third commandment. So the first commandment we learned who to worship, and then the second commandment, we learned how to worship, and today, in the third commandment, we learn the importance of using our words properly, or using our tongues properly, or our mouths properly, and how we speak. The third commandment is found in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 20, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless, who takes his name in vain. The tongue is a most dangerous item. And James tells us in James chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And so we need to learn how to use the tongue properly because otherwise the tongue is a wild beast that does much terrible harm. And this is what the third commandment really pertains to, using your tongue properly in a way that is honorable to God. Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about The commandment first, the commandment is, do not take God's name in vain, essentially. So I'll talk about that, I'll exposit that text. 
And then I'll give you the reason for the commandment. And the reason is, is that God will punish its violators. So we ought not take the name of God in vain. And the reason he gives is that those who do will most definitely be held guilty for doing so. And then at the end of the sermon, as I come to the end, what I'll do is I'll give all kinds of application for this text. And there's lots that I'll discuss. But that's how I'm going to divide it up. I'll start with the commandment, then I'll go to the reason, then I'll go to the application. I've been giving you this word of pastoral exhortation through every one of these commandments that we've looked at so far. And that is this, that the commandments are here to instruct us. They teach us. So God gives them to us so that we can learn how to live. And the commandments, very often because they are so searching, they bring about conviction of sin. So you're sitting there and you're listening to the sermon and they're searching through your hearts. And as they search through your hearts, you're brought under conviction. And that ought to drive you to the cross. I don't want you to leave the service feeling guilty. I want you to leave the service being thankful that Christ has borne your guilt. That's what I want you to leave the service with a sense of. So as the sense of guilt and shame comes upon you because the commandments search your hearts, and it, it, will, it will happen, make your way quickly to Jesus Christ by faith. And by faith, as he invites you to and commands you to, put your guilt and shame on him. He bore it all on the cross. So yes, receive the commandments is a rule for life. But don't come to the commandments thinking, this is what I have to do to be saved. Come to the commandments thinking, Jesus has already purchased my salvation. And the commandments teach me that I need salvation, that I'm a sinner. And so go to him with your sins and find forgiveness. Don't leave with a sense of guilt. Leave with a sense that Christ has atoned for your guilt. So a sense of gratitude. So that's the caution that I've given you throughout this, these commandments. And today we're in the third commandment. And the commandment is this, my first point, the commandment itself. Do not take God's name in vain. That's the commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, when we talk about the name of God, not taking God's name in vain. Name is associated with personal identity. So if I say your name, I'm addressing you. If you say my name, you're addressing me. So in one sense, the name is the person, and the person is the name, because they're so linked together. And so honoring God's name means you're honoring God in his person, and you're honoring God in his works. You're honoring God in his being. The name represents all of God. That's what his name represents. So again, relying on W.S. Plumer, as I have the last few weeks, he says this. Anything relating to the true God, his being, his nature, his will, his works, his worship, anything relating to the service rendered him or to the doctrine concerning him pertains to his name. His name is so closely associated with him that you could even say his name is him and he is his name. They're inseparable. That's how important his name is. God is identified with his name, and his name, God's name, identifies God. So when we talk about do not, taking, not taking God's name in vain, this is what we're referring to. God himself. Now, mentioning not taking God's name in vain, look at how he refers to himself again. This being the third time he refers to himself this way in the Ten Commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. How does he refer to himself? The Lord your God. This is the third use of that phrase, the Lord your God, in the Ten Commandments. The first use 
we saw was in the preamble, in verse 2, where it says, I am the Lord your God. And then we saw the second use in verse 5, the second commandment. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And here is the third use here in the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember, when I taught on that, what that means, the word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, as it likely occurs in your English translations, is how many Bible translators have chosen to translate the actual name of God, which is Jehovah. Jehovah, and we talked about this in the preamble. Jehovah, the name Jehovah, the name of God, represents or declares that he is the being from whom all other beings derive their being, and he is that being, derives his being from no other being. He is the self-existent one. He exists in and of himself, and his existence is contingent upon no other existence, and all other existence is contingent upon his existence. Jehovah, the being from whom all other beings derive their being, and the being who derives his being from no other being. Jehovah. So all of creation, all that you see in this world is contingent upon his existence, but his existence is contingent upon nobody else's existence. Jehovah, the Lord. The self-existent one. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. But it doesn't just say the Lord. It says just as the other two times we've seen this in Scripture, it says, the Lord, your God. So not just the one who is self-existent, but the self-existent one who personally identifies with his people. God is the self-existent one who personally identifies with his people. He is the Lord, your God. He identifies with you by relationship and by covenant, entering into personal relationship with you through Jesus Christ. And so this statement, the Lord your God, heightens the severity of the commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, because we're speaking of the self-existent one who enters into relationship with his people. The Lord your God, this is the one of whom we speak, and this is the one whose name you are not to take in vain. The Lord your God. Now, the commandment, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The word vain means empty, worthless, or baseless, unserious. So in other words... The commandment is, don't take the name of God in a baseless, empty, unserious, trite way. His name is not worthless. His name is not trite. His name is not baseless. So don't treat it that way. That's the essence. And this word vain occurs multiple times in the Bible. I'll give you two examples of how it's used, just so we can help we can understand the definition properly, but Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor build it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's useless. It's worthless. It's unneeded. Right? It's baseless. It's, it's contemptuous. Unnecessary. Our Psalm 31, for example, verse 6, similarly, it doesn't translate, this is the same Hebrew word, but it translates it differently. And how does it translate it here? It translates it as worthless. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols. That's the same word there, vain idols. So, to take the name of the Lord your God in vain is to take God's name and treat it is empty, worthless, baseless, unnecessary, trite, 
casual, unserious. That's what it means to take God's name in vain. Primarily, the application to this text, I think, pertains to oath-keeping and oath-breaking. So if someone enters into a solemn oath, so for example, an oath of office, or an elder enters into an oath to oversee the church properly, or someone enters into the membership covenant of the church, or the oath of marriage, That's, I think this is what the primary application is here. So you see this actually come out in Leviticus 19, verse 12, where that is, seems to be clear what it's referring to. Leviticus 19, verse 12, You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Making a vow to God, or a vow in the name of God, falsely, is to, in that instance, profane God's name. It's a profane God's name. And so not taking the name of the Lord your God in vain, primarily, I think the primary, the immediate application of this pertains to oath-keeping. Someone takes an oath of office as a governing official, or an elder takes an oath over the church to oversee the church properly, or somebody enters into the membership covenant of the church, or a couple gets married and they enter into covenant with each other in the name of God before the church. To do so in the name of God, which they do, is a most serious and solemn matter. And that's what the primary reference is. I think there's more references. I think there's more applications, and I'll, I'll bring those out later on in the sermon near the end. But I think that's primarily what's being discussed here because of Leviticus 19, verse 12. And so this means don't enter into oaths or covenants or invoke the name of God in emptiness as if it is a mere formality, which so many do. Oh, I just have to do it, so it's a formality, so I do it. No. This is to, end, to invoke God's name is not just a mere formality. To invoke God's name is serious business, and it's to invite his curse if you break your oath. So this is to say you ought not invoke God's name in emptiness as if it means little or nothing. The command, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, the command is a prohibition, meaning that if it is a prohibition, it's derived from a positive commandment. So the prohibition is a do not, but the com positive commandment is a do. And so as I've tried to be consistent throughout this series on the Ten Commandments, if the commandment is do not, well, that means on the flip side of it, it comes from a do. Well, this is a do not, so the flip side of it is it comes from a do. The commandment is you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It's a do not. But it comes from a do. And the do is, you shall seek to have the name of God hallowed in all the earth. Do you recognize that terminology from the Lord's Prayer? Matthew 6, verse 2. Hallowed be your name, Jesus taught us to pray. When we're praying, hallowed be your name, what are we praying? We're praying that the whole world would be obedient to the third commandment. That the whole world would hold and treat God's name as holy. So Leviticus 22 verse 32 points this out to us very nicely. It says, And you shall not profane my name, my holy name, that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. The opposite of profaning his name is sanctifying his name. Rendering it holy. Not making it holy. God's name is holy. You don't have to make it holy. You can't make it holy. It is holy. But to treat it as holy, to render it as holy, to count it as holy, to see it as holy, to evaluate it as holy. That's what it means to hallow his name. You don't make God's name holy. You just understand that it is holy. And if you're going to hallow God's name, you view it and treat it and render it 
is holy. Hallowed be your name. And the desire of the Christian ought to be that every tongue on earth hallows the name of God and every heart on earth hallows the name of God. That his name would be counted is holy among all peoples everywhere. This is really what the Great Commission is about. If you're going and making disciples out of all nations, what are you doing? You're teaching them to hallow the name of God, to treat his name as if it is holy. Leon Rogers, commenting on Jesus' prayer, hallowed be your name, said, explaining it, he says that the Holy One may secure before the whole world in a final and decisive way the holiness appropriate to his name to which human beings will respond with praise and exaltation. That should be your desire. I hope your desire is to see that everybody, not just that your neighbors won't go to hell, not just that your kids and your family members won't go to hell, but that they'll hallow God's name. That's what you want. The hallowing of the name of God is to be proclaimed as holy in all the earth and to be rendered and treated and handled as if it is holy because it is holy. Not making it holy, but evaluating it as holy, appraising it as holy. Edward Fisher, again, extends the application of this commandment by saying, the Lord in this commandment doth require that we sanctify his name in our hearts, with our tongues, and in our lives by thinking, conceiving, speaking, writing, and walking so as becomes the excellency of his titles, attributes, ordinance, works, and religion. Everything, all the time, everywhere. God is acknowledged. God is understood in our acknowledgement as being holy. There's not a square inch of this earth. There's not a place in your body, in your heart, where he ought not be considered holy. He ought to be considered holy everywhere, all the time, by all people. This is the point. So if the commandment is, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, so is the converse true. You shall hallow the name of God wherever you go all the time. That's strong, and it's absolutely right. John Gill, again commenting on it, said, The name of God ought never to be mentioned, but in grave and serious manner, and with an awe of the greatness of His majesty upon the mind. To live in a perpetual fear of God and conscious of his ever-seeing eye. And this is a generation that needs the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Imagine a world where people live that way. This is a world where your handshake is good enough because you know that the Lord sees it. This is a world that people operate with integrity in public and in private. It's a world where you need very little regulation and very little policy and very little contract because the word is good enough and it's a, it's a world where you don't need locked doors even or video surveillance cameras because it's a world where people walk around with the fear of God, hallowing his name because his name is holy. It's a recognition of who God is and what his name is. A world whereby God's name is feared in all our activities. So the worship of God, which we talked about in the second commandment, is, is an act that we do together. We gather together and we worship him. Or you worship him with your family and you, hopefully you have your own personal worship at set times throughout the day. It's worship. But the hallowing of God's name occurs not just in worship. It occurs at work. It occurs when you eat. It occurs when you participate in recreation. 
It occurs when you walk down the street. It occurs when you drive in your car. It is the ever-conscious presence of the eye of a holy God. Elicits the hallowing of his name from your heart. The hallowing of God's name. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And if that is true, we ought to hallow his name everywhere. That's the commandment. That's the commandment. I hope you're getting from these Ten Commandments that as we come to God and as we deal with God, interact with Him, we're dealing with a holy God. Right? And this would be a sin of of the contemporary church that people are too casual with Him. They're too trite with Him. They're too loose with Him. They're too fast and loose with Him. And and he's, they, they treat him basically with contempt, unseriously. And there's things in life, you know, that you can joke around and play around with. And there's, there's a time for joking and, and playing around. But when it comes to your dealings with God, that's not the time. That's not the time. Because you're dealing with the Holy One. And not just the Holy One, but how does it describe him? The Lord your God, the being from whom all other beings derive their being, and the being who derives his being from no other being, and yet is willing to identify with you as his people. The Lord your God. The commandment. The commandment. Let's go and look at the reason for this third commandment. The reason for it. God will punish the violators of this commandment. See what it says? You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. There's your commandment. What's the reason? For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And this simply means that God will hold him guilty who takes his name in vain. As Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 tells us, God is not mocked. If people want to mock God and hold his name in contempt, then he himself will demand that they give an account, and the day will come when they do give an account for it. So you have the commandment, and then you have the reason. And the reason for the commandment is that God will punish the violators of this commandment. And it may appear that the violators will go unpunished, but God keeps a record and will deal with the transgressors. How many times have you seen somebody openly mock God or openly blaspheme God or openly enter into an oath before God as if it is a mere formality and it looks like they just walk scot-free? I've seen people do that stuff. I've seen people say, they think, oh, if God's really alive, you know, they, they invite him to curse them in that moment. It doesn't happen. But what does this text tell us? It will happen. Just not yet. But it'll happen. And so this is is a promise that God will deal with those who do not uphold the honor of his name and do not hallow his name and those who take his name in vain. So Thomas Watson said of this, He that robs another of his goods shall be put to death, but that he that robs God of his glory by oaths and curses is spared. But God himself will take the matter into his own hand, and he will punish him who takes his name in vain. Look, you go into a store and you rob a store, you're probably going to get caught and go to jail. But if you go outside and you curse God or you enter into an oath as if it's a mere formality and you don't need to uphold that oath in the name of God, you're probably not going to go to jail. But the text is promising you that God will deal with you. He'll deal with you. He will have the last word on the use of his name. Ezekiel 36 verse 23 says, And I will vindicate the holiness of of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, who brought you, who threw you, and when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. So in summary, 
God's name must not be taken in vain, and his name must be hallowed because the violators will be judged. It's that simple. Hallow his name or he will judge you. Do not take his name in vain, and if you do, he will judge you, and he will hold you to account. So the prohibition, moving into the application section, the prohibition, like the other prohibitions in the commandments makes it enforceable on a civil level. So you can't enforce the commandment, hallow God's name, because that's a matter of the heart. You, you can't, in a civil manner, enforce that. But you can enforce the words, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, because that's an action, taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. Hallowing is from the heart, but taking God's name in vain is an action. So that can be enforced. That can be enforced. And as I noted earlier, as we talk about this, I believe that the pri there's multiple applications we're going to get into, but the primary application of this commandment, on a civil level especially, is the oath-taking, is the taking of oaths. And I believe that because of Leviticus 19, verse 12, says, you shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of the Lord your God, I am the Lord. Now, we live in a society, a country, where those who are in office do make oaths. Civil servants make oaths. Members of parliament make oaths. Okay, members of the provincial legislature, provincial parliament make oaths. And they do so before God. And their oaths are Christian oaths. And they all trace their way back up to the head of state in our system. So that our head of state, who is King Charles III, entered an oath when he received his coronation, when he was coronated. He entered into an oath. And then the civil servants and the members of parliament, they enter into an oath to the king essentially declaring that they will uphold the king's oath, in essence. So that everything in our society, whoever designed it this way was, was genius because they're designing it in such a way that every civil servant is bound by oath to uphold the justice of God, what they do. So I'll give you an example from the king's coronation oath. The king's asked by... A, he receives a Bible in his coronation oath, and then he's asked by a minister, he's, "Sir, do you keep, or sir, to keep you ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God is the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes? Receive this book, the most valuable thing that the world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God." So the king receives this book under the pretense that the book itself, the Bible, is the lively oracles of God, is his royal law, and is his wisdom the most valuable thing this world affords. The king receives it. And, and then the king in this ceremony puts his hand on the Bible and declares and is asked this question by the minister, will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the peoples of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, your other realms and the territories, that means us, to any of them belonging or pertaining according to the respect of laws and customs. And the king says, I do. And then the archbishop says, will you to your power cause law and justice in mercy to be executed in all your judgments? And then the king replies, I will. And so with his hand on a Bible, with an oath before God, he is acknowledging that the law of God is the supreme law, and he is declaring that he will uphold law and justice is the king. And, and you say, well, that's just a formality. Yeah, that's what the third commandment forbids, is formalities in the name of God, just for the sake of formality. And then you, what you do when you go to the parliament, they, um, the members of our parliament enter into an oath, and they will say, they say, I, and then they say their names, and they say, 
do swear that I will be faithful to bear true allegiance to his majesty, King Charles III. Or they'll say, I, and then say their name, do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to his majesty, King Charles III. And so when they're swearing allegiance to the king, what are they doing? They're swearing allegiance to the oath that the king has made. So that you have this system that is all bound up in an oath that receives the Bible is the law of God and declares that I will uphold true, the true law and justice in my reign. So that they are seen as the ministers of God's law. And that's a serious thing that people do that. Now, of course, they don't understand it as serious. Many of them don't anyway. Some of them might, but many of them don't, and most of them certainly don't follow through with it. But this is how the third commandment is to be consistently replied, someone st or applied. Someone stands up, swears an oath in the name of God. Now they're expected to do it, and then the third commandment comes with a promise. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So you, so you hear there's, there's a measure of justice that is built into the oath that's going to fall down on the government that takes an oath but doesn't uphold justice. So if the government is not punishing the guilty and protecting the innocent, guess who's going to punish the government? For I, the Lord your God, will not hold him guiltless who takes my name in vain. So there's a promise, there's an appeal to God in that which is quite genius of whoever invented this system of oaths that we live in. And even the police officers have to take some type of an oath of office when they become peace officers, try and uphold the peace, as they say they do, so that when they violate our constitutional rights, they're in violation of the third commandment. No, many are not taught this, but this is simply the way it is. And this ought to, if you're living in an unjust society, and there are injustices that are in our society, we've experienced some of them, but if you're living in an unjust society where the government is not operating in justice, and you come to the third commandment, and you know that our government is bound by oath to uphold justice, what you ought to be able to do is have a measure of comfort. Because the, you, what you're doing, you're, you're not finding your ultimate hope for justice in an administrator who doesn't uphold justice, you're finding your ultimate hope for justice in a God who will not hold him guiltless, who takes his name in vain. God himself will visit them if they don't do their jobs. And this applies for the, within the realm of the church. When elders enter into an oath, pastors enter an oath, they take their office in the church. It even applies to church members who enter into the oath of a covenant and recite the covenant vows in front of the church. It enters into, it, it applies to a marital vow that is done before the congregation in the name of the Lord, inviting the curse of God if that covenant is violated. And so I think this is the primary application of the third commandment. It, to take God's name in vain is to take his name in the form of an oath and not really mean it and not follow through with it. It's a mere formality. We just do it because we have to. That's how it's applied in the civil realm or in the church realm. But, it, but it's deeper than that, is it applies to your heart, and it flows out in your daily life. It's deeper than that. Because there's all kinds of opportunity to treat God's name with triteness and foolishness as if his name is baseless and worthless. So you could, some people will, they'll hit their hand with a hammer and they'll say God's name as a swear word. Jesus' name is a swear word. You know, they, they stub their toe. And the first thought that come out is to, take the, is to take the name of the Lord in vain. And that's a terrible thing. You shouldn't be doing that. And one of the things that I've, I taught my Family, I tried to create a culture in my home where there's a level of wholesomeness in communication, so there's no obscenities. Well, every now and then, as you can imagine, sometimes there's unwholesomeness that comes out of 
people's mouths, but I'll say, I've never heard anyone in my home take the name of the Lord in vain, for which I'm thankful. And I've tried to create a culture in which people in our home revere and honor the name of the Lord because it is to be treated with holy is with holiness because he himself is holy and you should be creating similar cultures in your home so that it would there's things that are unacceptable but if they happen they happen but there are things that are absolutely off limits and one of those things is taking the name of God in vain I mean you might as well kill the family dog before you do that because that's how serious it is to take the name of the Lord your God in vain it ought not be done so swearing and using God's name as a curse word is purely evil. Someone, you know, maybe you're, you're be, you stub your toe or you hit your hand with a hammer and you're tempted to invoke a curse. Right? People will say things like, damn it, if they do that. Well, damn it is a real command because God's going to damn people to hell. He's going to look to people on judgment day and he's going to say, damn them. But to invoke that curse over in, in, a, in an act of rage or anger is, I think, to take the name of God in vain because you're invoking a curse that only God can take, invoke. Now, there's certain things that we know will be damned and there's certain things that we know that will be damned. And even there's imprecatory prayers, which are prayers that God will damn something or someone. But to do so in a, in a moment of passionate rage is to evoke the name of God and to transgress this commandment. People will say things, you know, they'll tell someone to go to hell or something like that. It should never be done because that's essentially what you're doing. In a, in a moment of passionate rage, you're invoking God's act to sentence someone or something to the eternal fires of hell. I've heard people say, I've even heard people in this church do this. There is an act of surprise. They say, oh my, and then they invoke God's name. You should never do that because that's taking his name lightly and tritely. And in fact, if you hear people say that, you should correct them. You shouldn't be doing that. It shouldn't be going on is his name is not to be used is a trivial expression of shock or surprise. His name is to be reserved for reverence and to be treated as if it is holy because it is holy. God's name. I don't think we should be entertained by movies that use God's name in a trite way, even if it fits the scene or story in the plot line of the movie because they're treating it frivolously for the sake of entertainment. And I think that saying you're a Christian, but then living loosely is to take God's name in vain, because it's hypocrisy, and you're invoking the name of Christ to identify with him, and then you're showing the world that you're a hypocrite, and that is bringing dishonor to his name. So hypocrisy, or how about this, worshiping with your lips, but not with your heart. Praying with your lips, but not with your heart. Repeating his name mindlessly in prayer, as some people do. For no point. Just for filler. Or there's, there's people who will come and they'll say things like, God told me to do this. Now, I think you, you might have be able to say, I had a sense that God was leading me to do this. I think that's appropriate if you... If you I think I might have had a sense to definitively say God told me to do this or God wanted me to do this. Unless it's in the scripture, I think you're crossing the line then. But to come and say, I think God might be leading me, well, that's legit. But to invoke his name as if you now have special access to God and it's unclear is, is, is senseless. God, some of the people will say, God told me to tell you this. Really? Really? You really want to go down that road? It's quite dangerous. Some people will say, you know, there's charismatic groups where they get into this name it and claim it stuff. And they think if they invoke the name of the Lord, then they're for sure going to get well. And they're for sure going to get that job. And, and something for sure is going to happen so that, so that the Lord's name is invoked is some type of 
good luck charm. It's like rubbing a rabbit's foot or something like that, which is to treat his name with triteness. His name's not a charm. His name's not a magic spell. It's not a potion. It's not hocus pocus that you can invoke to all of a sudden get what you want. His name is to be treated treated with reverence and not looseness. And people, some people, they enter into the church covenant. They don't take it seriously. I've seen this before. If you enter into the church covenant, you ought to take it seriously. And that's why we review it here about every half year. Because we're entering into a covenant in the name of God together. And there's people who advocate for sin in the name of God. I still remember when our premier would get up and he would say, you know, love your neighbors. Remember, he, he's basically calling on us to obey Scripture. Love your neighbors how? By not going to church and worshiping Jesus. Well, that this is using God's name in vain. Using God's name and God's commandments to kind of cajole people into disobedience to God. I've had people tell me, that you confront them in their sin and like, well, God's given me peace about my sin. Mm-hmm. I've heard it. Really, you want to go down that road, do you? Yep. God's given me peace. I know it's okay. I prayed about it and it's okay. Pastor, I know. Right? Some people, they'll say, I got a special insight into this situation. I got no evidence, but I got an insight. And you invoke the Lord's name because it's got to be the Lord that gave them the insight. Not based on material fact, just because they felt it. It's not good. The social justice movement, people invoking the name of God to propagate essentially socialism and Marxist ideologies which are completely contrary to Scripture using and manipulating the consciences of Christians to buy into this nonsense. And if you're going to dedicate your child before the church, you ought to mean it and follow through with it. And if you're going to enter into marriage vows, you ought to mean it. Follow through with it. But all of these, what I've just mentioned by way of application, are prohibitions. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. That's all I just did, if you caught on. I just went through a grocery list of do nots. But the grocery list of do nots can be summed up with one do. And if you simply just hallow the name of God in your heart, all of those do nots become second nature. It's not even an issue. Those do nots are not like a heavy burden upon your back. It's like, well, of course. I mean, I'm hallowing God's name. I treat his name as holy. I, I reverence his name. Why? Of course I wouldn't do that. It's not, I don't even want to think about that. And so this is, in essence, if you want to get to the heart of the issue, behind the third commandment, if you want to get to the heart of it, what you need to do is you need to hallow his name every day and always everywhere, recognizing his name his person, his acts, his attributes is holy and treating them as holy. And then all of those other do-nots just become second nature because it's summed up in this one do, which is a disposition of the heart. And the disposition of the heart is hallow his name always, everywhere, all the time. Let's pray. Lord, we pray to you and forgive us for the times where we don't hallow your name, when we've taken your name in vain. And I pray, dear God in heaven, that you would draw us nigh unto the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness, comfort us by his death on the cross, and strengthen us for the works of obedience and righteousness that you've called us to, that his name would be hallowed in our hearts and in our lives. In Christ's name.